all. This is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. And with me, we have our own Dr. Keith Berkowitz. Welcome, Dr. Keith Berkowitz. Thank you, Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. It's always a delight to have you. And um, Cool Beans, as you can see, I have my coffee here because Keith is going to be talking and I'm <laughs> going to be sipping my coffee at night, though, which will make the rest of my night very interesting as well. So, <laughs> Keith, once again, welcome. Uh, the discussion that I want to start with is a very common, two very common problems for which I think that either the progress is very slow or we do not yet know how to manage them well, very well. So you are practicing. I think these two are very interesting to ask you. One of them is tinnitus after COVID or vaccine. And the other one is the autonomic dysfunction or an appearance of the autonomic dysfunction where the patient has tachycardias and palpitations and then they have uh, postural hypertension or dizziness, even fainting. So let's start with the second part first. Or, or let's start from the baseline first. How about COVID? COVID, not the long COVID. Do you see much patients of COVID nowadays? Actually, this week we've had a, a nice little surge. of, And the trouble now is we're not sure what it is, whether it's COVID, RSV, influenza. I've had uh, other viruses, rhinovirus, enterovirus. So we're actually seeing a huge surge in viral illness. Absolutely. And as the cold weather uh, swings in, the surge would continue to increase. And interestingly, tell me if I'm wrong, but with the COVID morphing more towards upper respiratory type infection, more towards human coronavirus type infection, still very dangerous compared to other human, human coronaviruses, it will become more and more difficult to see, to differentiate it from other viruses. Absolutely. And what's interesting is when we're doing testing, people are doing home testing now more, you know, commonly than, you know, going to a place for PCR test. And they're finding that actually the testing is pretty negative a lot of the time. So I have people that are testing negative for four days, then the fifth day they're testing positive. So it's very different than what we've seen in the past. And, you know, as I've talked to in the past with you, I treat more on symptoms than opposed to, you know, a positive test. And I think now with these other viruses, and we're not really sure, are they also cross-reacting on the testing? So is the testing good enough to really properly distinguish between the different viruses we're seeing? Understood. So uh, before, once again, going to the long COVID, the basic topic for today, uh, with this acute COVID, has your management approach changed? Or has any part of your management become more challenging now? And so you are looking for other possibilities and what these may be? So what's interesting, I mean, the nice part, and you've probably said this you know, to your audience, it's much more mild, right? We're seeing a much more mild illness than we've seen before. What, what really is a major issue, though, is and what we're seeing is people are testing positive for a much, much longer period of time. I remember in early stages when we thought of, you know, of the alpha strain or the beta or delta gamma, people would be positive for five, six, seven days, maybe. Now I'm really seeing people positive up to 14 days. And what's interesting is they're not symptomatic necessarily after five or six days, but they're still testing positive. And our challenge is, and you know, I think not everyone's sure, how long is someone actually contagious? Are they still contagious when they're testing positive? Or is that just the remnant of you know the virus has been there before? So can I make a comment on this one for how long they would be positive? Thinking about human coronaviruses that are about 86% of our population has them in our throat. And that means we'll be positive for them. If SARS-CoV-2 eventually becomes more human coronaviruses like, then wouldn't this always be positive in majority of our population uh, going forward? I would say yes. And the question is, what are we testing positive for, right? If we've always been exposed to coronaviruses, right? And I wonder if previous exposure also to COVID and now re-exposure, is that really creating that humanized type of virus that's kind of, I guess, the term endemic into our you know, population? Correct. Correct. And um, for the audience, for the cool beans here, this doesn't mean that the coronavirus has become um, totally harm 
harmless the sars cov 2 it is still very dangerous it can still cause issues so uh, but as it continues to become more human friendly or humanized it will become more endemic in our population so uh, patients are positive multiple viruses are present how is severity so it's what's really interesting severity is in a different part i know we had talked previously back when omicron was first around about how it was more upper you know as opposed to early on where it was more pulmonary complications now we're seeing i'm seeing a lot of coronavirus followed by acute sinusitis so people are actually now developing oftentimes a secondary bacterial infection so they have a, a lot of sinus pressure sinus headache even after already recovering from that first stage of covid and so that's what's different that's very mm -hmm different than what we saw early on in Omicron and obviously, you know, years before that. So, so these probably are secondary infections because the immune system is busy somewhere else. So it is not as optimally running after having to fight with the other viruses. And so now bacterial infections are taking hold. So do you, uh, antibiotics, do you use them? You wait for them? What is your approach? I see many doctors are kind of a little hesitant with the antibiotics. What do you do? So, I mean, we look at antibiotics, obviously, you know, I'll, I'll, again, the histamines we had talked about before, definitely antihistamines have a big role in this aspect, especially with all the sinus pressure, the inflammation that's going on. I, I kind of are using in a lot of cases antibiotics early both from the anti-inflammatory effect, again, which sinusitis, even though it, it could be viral, will have a benefit. And also in some cases, I'm seeing, you know, secondary bacterial, but I suspect the secondary bacterial sinusitis. Got it. And for the COVID itself, is there any change? For example, there are possibilities of using, let's say, ivermectins or uh, vitamin Ds and vitamin C. And so the, all of those, my apologies, uh, do you have any other regime that you use? So again, I, I still like the, the, you know, the basics we use for immune support, vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, quercetin, I find definitely continue that. I, in some cases I'll use ivermectin. What's interesting though, and, and, and this goes back to the point we were talking before about positivity, I'll often use ivermectin and in the past, we would see the viral load really decrease pretty immediately. Now I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing the symptoms decrease, but the viral load, or if we think it's that's what's correlated with a positive test, still happen for up to 10 to 12 days, even if they've already completed their course of ivermectin of five days, they still could be positive for five or six days, even Got though it. they're not symptomatic. Hmm. So they're not symptomatic. They are uh, so interesting. So ivermectin may not be helping as much with the newer variants. But luckily, the variants themselves are becoming milder. So there is a balancing act that is going on. OK, so if we now move from COVID, let, let me ask you about the respiratory syncytial vi virus. Are you seeing that in adults as well, immunocompromised or comorbidity adults? With How are you seeing that? So it's so strange. Again, a lot of cases I don't see in the office. So I'm not, you know, we're not having specific testing for it. So I'm. I'm What's interesting is I'm not sure which is which. I was actually speaking to one of my friends today. She's a pediatrician. She had 40 cases yesterday. She said she had more cases yesterday and sent more kids to the emergency room this week than she has throughout COVID. Interesting. So there's an interesting question from Yikes. She's saying, what is being tested for now when they look for COVID? What is the test? So what tests are you use, doing and what is the use of the test nowadays? So typically now we've really moved into a home testing stage where most people are actually being diagnosed at home. So they're using the rapid home test in general. I think that's the majority, obviously, in the hospitals, you know, in other uh, acute care settings, we're using PCR tests. But I would say the majority of the diagnosis now is based on a home test. I see overwhelmingly where, and again, people are not, and in my practice, they'll call before. So, you know, we probably won't see them when they come in with COVID. But they'll call me and say, I have a cold, uh, I got congestion, I have all these other things, you know, could this be COVID? And the first thing I hear, I tested myself negative four times and I'm negative. I go, it's COVID. Then I get a call back the next day, I tested positive. So what's <laughs> really interesting is that the, the, I think the testing, and maybe this is the change in the virus, 
is, is really not as accurate as we saw before, or it could take several days to have a positive test. Interesting. Okay, so now we're going to move towards the long COVID. And within the long COVID, these two more very prevalent and difficult to treat situations. So let's start with the tinnitus first. Have you found a solution for tinnitus? Uh, I, I would have to say tinnitus, of all the symptoms and all the complications, has to be the hardest one of all. You know, and again, the challenge is depending on where they get it from. So again, the longer someone's had it, I think the more difficult it is to repair, definitely. The vaccine injury as opposed to long COVID, that's also more challenging. And so a couple of mechanisms that I've thought of and I've tried looking at things like vascular, is it a vascular problem? Is it an inflammatory problem? You know, is it even a simple thing? In some cases, it could be nasal congestion or histamine related problem. Those tend to be the most easily resolved. The ones that may be even in, inflammatory or, you know, possibly vascular are much more challenging. I am still looking, I hope you have a better solution because I think we're not having as good a success with that symptom as opposed to a lot of other things we're treating. Yeah, so I don't have much success as well. Those who develop tinnitus after COVID or after vaccine and they the tinnitus does not go away within three, four days, they just keep having it even on a cyclical basis. And I'll give you my own example. So my tinnitus, I used to have it from childhood. I had it when I could not even articulate what it is. I used to ask people that, hey, do you hear that sound in your ears? And they would say, what sound? And I'd be surprised <laughs> they don't hear this sound. So I had it forever. So I don't really care for it. But for last two, three days, once again, I heard it to be a little louder. And I have no other ex exposure. So it just keeps coming and going in cycles since my COVID infection. And it used to become better with aspirin, but now it doesn't respond to anything. Right. So what's interesting, so the question is, are these, you know, cells, you know, permanently damaged? I mean, I think that's what, you know, and, and I don't think we have a good way of really determining that. And I guess that level of damage is really probably what's going to determine how well someone improves, you know, versus someone who doesn't improve. But again, this is, I think, the hardest symptom to treat of all. Sorry, I was on mute. So Nicolene says antihistamine diet helps. Okay, so uh, Mary says it's swear by neti pot. <laughs> so Mary, is that for tinnitus or just in general? M. Gregory says tinnitus may be lack of certain vitamins or minerals, which I am kind of overdosed on <laughs> vitamins and minerals. So Maybe we'll that is the reason. <laughs> so pre-COVID, right before COVID, a lot of people use things like bioflavonoids. So that was one group of supplements that really seemed to have make a difference. And this is pre-COVID. Another, what's interesting, another hypothesis I learned years ago, could it be also be related to low blood sugar? So there was a theory that low blood sugar really kind of triggered some of the symptoms because if you think of the symptoms of tinnitus, people get them most commonly when it's quiet, when they're at rest, when there's not a lot of things going on. And when they're active, the symptoms tend to be a lot less. So there was a thought that I've tried both, <laughs> hmm. you know, and it's, it's, it's still, it, the mechanism may be different this time, but it's still very hard to treat. And it uh, is. Gosh. It is. I, I know some other patients as well whose tinnitus just keeps hanging on. Um, Yike says, what does the at-home test test for? What are the tests looking for? I think we, we responded to that. Uh, most of these are for SARS-CoV-2, correct? Correct, yes. Okay, so now the big one, mm -hmm. the long COVID or after COVID infection or vaccine issues with the uh, postural hypertension and palpitations. So if I can just give a quick overview of the physiology, and then I would like to hear your, your management approach. Mm -hmm. So you bring in the practice experience and let me bring in the mechanism. So what happens is, imagine I get COVID infection. And after that infection, I have autoantibodies. Those antibodies are against the receptors, muscarinic and, and uh, you know, adrenergic receptors. So that means receptors for epinephrine or epinephrine and acetylcholine. The result of that is that now when 
if I am sitting right now, if I stand up, what will happen is my body will immediately release epinephrine, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine to kind of increase my heart rate a little bit. Because when I stand up, my, my blood will flow downwards. That would cause the baroreceptors to pick up that the blood volume or blood somehow pressure is reduced. That would cause the release of epinephrines like substances, which will cause tachycardia, brief tachycardia. Then vasoconstriction would occur. Blood pressure would become normalized and I'll be fine. I would not even know that my body did that. But in, the, in, the, in these patients, what happens is that when they stand up, the epinephrine release is overwhelmingly more than less. So when there is a lot of epinephrine released, that causes severe uh, tachycardia, plus palpitations is defined as the awareness of the heart beat. So they would feel the palpitations. And now as the tachycardia occurs and the palpitations or force of contraction increases, that causes blood pressure to go up more than needed, which causes a reflex, you know, parasympathetic system or vagal uh, triggering, which then causes vasodilatation and blood pressure goes down and blood volume starts pooling in the lower legs, which then causes fainting and even, uh, sorry, spinning, dizziness, nausea, and even fainting. So that is a basic mechanism. It could be with hypovolemia as well. This could be because of these uh, hormonal imbalances. Question for you. First, let's start with the management. Do you see such patients? How do you manage them? So actually, I see two different presentations a lot of times. And one of the presentations is when we, we, we call, when I do what I call orthostatic measurements, right? Where I'll measure blood pressure, pulse, sitting, stand, uh, lot, supine, lying, sitting and standing. And what we'll see typically in a young person, the pulse will go up by more than 25 from supine up till standing. Or in an older person, their blood pressure could either go up or go down, will drop. I have a second presentation I've seen where, and it's a little different, interesting with mild exertion, people will have a very large increase in the heart rate that they may feel okay when they're resting, but a little bit of exertion they have this overwhelming heart rate response. I remember one of my first cases, this young man, I walked around the hallway and his heart rate went to 145 just by walking around yeah, the hallway. Yeah, it is very common. And I just wanted to quickly respond to Alexander. Yes, Alexander, the mechanism that I mentioned, I am talking in context of the long COVID as well. So back to you, Keith. So the, the question, and, and what I've always was taught, we you know, throughout my, my career is, my thought is always to increase volume first, right? So one thing we assume, again, if, if either heart rate or blood pressure is changing, is if we can actually increase volume, and, I, and the best way is through you know, normal saline intravenously, can we actually relax the heart? So, right, so that will heart rate come down, will blood pressure stabilize? And, and, in, and a lot of people does. The other thing we'll add with that is oftentimes magnesium with that, which also, helps also manage the heart rate and also, you know, bring down blood pressure as well. What's interesting though, and I was saying before, is typically I never saw where the blood pressure went up. And that I also see as well. That's really new, you know, in, in long COVID where typically we look for a drop in blood pressure, but it actually could be in either, either format, either way. And, and that actually, once again, if there is an autoimmune outcome because of the molecular mimicry and the receptors for epinephrine or epinephrine are stimulated by the antibodies and then you add more epinephrine when somebody stands up, then there can be a shooting of the blood pressure. And if the parasympathetic system cannot counter it enough, then they would just have a higher blood pressure. Which is, which is interesting to me because I was always taught if someone has high blood pressure, the last thing you want to give them is intravenous sailing, right? Because you'll send the blood pressure up. But interesting enough, it actually has the opposite effect. It actually brings the blood pressure back down. And I think the first couple of times I did that, I made my nurse very, very anxious. <laughs> of course. I mean, if somebody has higher blood pressure, you add more volume. And so please, for, nor, for non-medicals, this is not a prescription. And for, my, <clears throat> for the doctors and nurses or providers, please be careful. Be very, very sure 
that this may be the mechanism. If that is not the mechanism, don't do it because that would just make them. And, a, and a, one of the things we can actually, you know, with lab work, we can actually confirm it. I'll do a urine oftentimes and we'll see a very high specific gravity or we'll see, you know, in the blood work, a high, you know, CO2 level in the blood. So we'll look at other other markers to kind of confirm that diagnosis, especially you, like that. And you're going to confirm the diagnosis of hypovolemia? Correct. Correct? So yes. If there is hypovolemia, then then volume correction is important, regardless of how the heart rate or the blood pressure may be looking like. Normally, we say in medicine that hypovolemia cannot correct it above the normal, but here we also have the mimicry going on and antibodies coming in, which are also causing the epinephrine or acetylcholine receptors to be to be stimulated. And then comes the epinephrine when I stand up. And so this just becomes compounded. So very interesting. Uh, a question here from Andrea. Andrea says, what kind of magnesium? So intravenously, we'll use magnesium chloride is, is common what we use. So I actually want to bring up another point with the reason why you want to correct hypovolemia first, what I've learned is the other treatments don't work. In, in a very stressed state, which hypovolemia is, the body really can't take on other roles. So, you, you know, trying to make it use other resources is very complicated. And I learned, you know, with treatment that if I didn't correct the hypovolemia first and try to do other treatments or mechanisms, they weren't successful. And it makes sense. So if somebody has hypovolemia, not only they're going to have cardiovascular or hemodynamics instability issues, they have less blood flow and less blood volume going to the tissues. That means nutritional supply is less. That means lactic acid is going to start accumulating. That means the local acidosis is going to occur. The tissues are going to start saying, hey, we are getting damaged here. They are going to start producing their own inflammatory markers. So there is the whole body is going to go in a very strange state of affairs. And so it is important to look at the volume and fix that. And then the rest of the body would start coming back towards normalcy. So I want to bring another mechanism in. So there's another, and I want to hear what your thought is. So the other group that I see benefit from this is I do see a group of people that develop blood sugar instability, where they get blood sugar volatility, where either the glucose is high or the glucose is low. And in, especially in the low glucose, insulin is inappropriately high. So there's a mismatch. And they also tend to get that same kind of, you know, norepinephrine adrenaline response from that. That group also seems to benefit as well, because I think by giving the normal saline, we're able to stabilize the glucose level much faster. And this could also be, again, without knowing the mechanism, I'm just now going to be thinking in <laughs> terms of the mechanisms. And that is, it is possible that if a person is hypovolemic, and they have an autoimmune disorder going on with the epinephrine hormone or epinephrine receptor antibodies. And if these antibodies are keeping the system in that stressed out state, that will mean the body would generally be insulin resistant. And the other possibility you and I were talking about, maybe there is something going on with the pancreas. Maybe there's inflammation over there and pancreas yeah. isn't fu functioning correctly. And also, again, one of the other things I don't know, I see in lab work, which is really unusual, is the liver dysfunction, where we'll see actually high iron levels but low ferritin. So I wonder if that, and you know, I'm trying to find any literature about that. I don't know if you've ever seen, I've never heard of that combination prior to COVID. Me neither. And, and the point is, is that iron kind of, it's not really iron overload because ferritin, which is a measure of iron storage is normal, but is that actually affecting the way the liver deals with glucose? Yeah, so do you, you see the ferritin to be normal, above normal, below normal? But in a lot of cases, below normal. Hmm. And With that, that may be, we know that the ferritin-like substances are reduced be, during the infections or stressful situations because the body is trying to keep the iron away from the pathogens. So maybe the bo body has never actually come out of that inflammatory state of conserving the ferritin and leaving the iron in the macrophages in the bone and other places. So uh, you, we, you do the volume correction, you give them magnesium as well. What else? So we'll also often do B12 as well. So I'll do B12 together with that to help. I think it calms some of the, the, the nerve or sympathetic overdrive people have that goes along with that. And that does help a lot. And do you mind if I, before we get there, 
the group that I find most at risk. We started talking about that. So yes. the group I find most at risk for that is people with actually a genetic predisposition, people that have the gene called MTHFR, which affects, I can never pronounce it, so I'm not going to try it, so which affects the body's ability to take folic acid or folate and convert it into a usable form, which is methylfolate, and there, thereby impacts their neurotransmitter production. That group seems to also get more of these kind of POTS or, or blood pressure, heart rate variability issues. Is that the methyl tetrahydrofolate? MPI yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly... Okay. I think reductase, right? Tetra yes, reductase, R for reductase. So methyl tetrahydrofolate <laughs> reductase. So that means it is working with the uh, folates. And that means, uh, so you were mentioning, this is the enzyme that would help make dopamines and serotonins and others. Right, and so I'm gonna make it even more complicated. So okay. also I think a lot of these patient souls have digestive issues. So I think that is even impacting their ability to make neurotransmitters. So I think what's really interesting is that the system really isn't responding well because it's unable to compensate for this overly stressed thing. Interesting. So how do you manage them? <laughs> so we're going to get all of your recipes right here and we're going to sell them. <laughs> <laughs> so first, again, fluid. And, and, and the, you, know what, I, I, you know where I took this from? If you go back, when people come in sick, right, to the hospital with flu or other symptoms, what's the first thing they get? They get intravenous fluids. So to me, it was like, okay, let's try that first because it's, you know, the body's probably stressed, you know, from, from being, having an infection or low COVID or a vaccine injury. What I'll often do afterwards, which I find that does help, but I don't do it up until the, the patient's volume, you know, repleted is I'll intravenous vitamin C definitely has an effect. And, and where the effect is, I think it does really help endothelial function. Very interesting. So of course, the possibility of this this symptom set, which is the tachycardia, palpitations, blood pressure irregularities, fainting, dizziness, there can be hypovolemic issues, there can be blood vascular endothelial issues, there could be hormonal issues, there could be all of them together. Okay, so a couple of questions from here. Um, one question is from... Uh, so Martin says that what are your thoughts on Harry Mullis's in retro PCR tests saying that they're not to be used? So Martin, even if I say that, yeah, sure, let's not use them. These have been now used for two and a half years. So interesting discussion, but let's, I want to stick to the, so we have Keith here. He's practicing every day. He's managing patients. I want to get maximum out of him. So this, <laughs> this discussion becomes valuable. This one part of the long COVID with the uh, autonomic like dysfunction. I don't want to call it aut autonomic dysfunction. I do not think it is an autonomic dysfunction disease. I think it is a set of circumstances or pathologies that then give the appearance of an autonomic dysfunction. And I want to make sure we can get the uh, solutions from Keith. Uh, let's see one more question. Uh, Hoke says, I have had con constant pulsatile tinnitus, constant gut pain, head pressure, brain fog, all constant symptoms since one week after my second Pfizer, over one year suffering. Have you seen this in others? So do you see in context of Pfizer or just in general with vaccines? As yes. Well? So, so, so actually there we, we may be a couple different mechanisms, right? We can talk about, uh, we'll skip over the tinnitus because we kind of talked about, but the gut Gut pain is really interesting. So I really, one of my colleagues, uh, Sabine Azan, who's done some studies, we actually see that the both COVID and probably the vaccine probably does have a major negative impact on the gut microbiome. And, and what, sh, what they're seeing in practice is one of the main phylum we know as bifidobacterium seems to be really damaged by this. And I think that's where we're seeing a lot of the digestive stuff come from. And, and I, actually, what's interesting, in all my long COVID or vaccine injured, I will give them something to help repair the gut, every single patient. I think that's so critical. And, you know, we mentioned before, even when you look at things like um, POTS or the, you know, orthostatic changes, neurotransmitters, which are really the regulatory process behind that, are made in our digestive tract. So a non-functioning digestive tract really plays a big issue. Then, you know, we talked about the uh, brain fog and other things. 
It brings up my favorite issue, I know Mobin loves us, which is histamines. <laughs> so I love talking about histamines. And someone talked about antihistamine diet. So histamines may be part of that mechanism behind it. So histamines are, you know, we know when we have allergies, we have a histamine response, that sort of, but they're also markers of inflammation. In addition, they're also involved with the way our muscles function, the way energy is provided. And that also may be part of the reason for the for the brain fog. Brain fog is so interesting. I think the problem is there's so many different mechanisms. Is it autoimmune? Is it vascular? Is it post-inflammatory? Is it post-viral? Is it histamine? It, it's, and I think it's very challenging to determine which of those because all five of those can definitely contribute to the brain fog part of the So then how do you manage that? So, <laughs> My questions are going to be, how do you manage that? This so, video, I'm greedy <laughs> to make it the best video for long COVID. So what we want to do is you got to start somewhere. And I, and I think I've always liked the supportive method. You know, easy things you can do first. Again, we talked about fluid, right? Correcting hypovolemia. That's an easy one, right? And I think people with that will benefit from that right away. I think we learn about giving gut support. I use a lot of, I like soil-based probiotics. I also like using what we call bovine immunoglobulins, which are like colostrum, to help with some of the digestive issues. I like using an antihistamine diet. I use that a lot, actually. I measure histamines because that is also really... Also, and we started talking about a little bit of blood sugar stabilization. If you can... And, and really the key in doing those things first is the key is to get the body out of a stress state. If we can at least get the body out of a stress state, I think we have more chance of correcting the problem. I think oftentimes where our mistake is made is we try and fix something when the body's still in a stress state and it, it's, it says back to us, hey, I can't do one more thing. So I think that's always the foundation of the start is to correct those, which I call low hanging fruit first and then work on other things after that. Totally makes sense. So if you are ready, I have some questions here as well from the <laughs> cool beans. Cool beans are the best. The thing that is unique about the cool beans is that they know mechanisms. We have spent two, three years now talking about mechanisms. So the questions are always awesome. So <laughs> let's start. Let's start from here. I'm going to start from the latest and go backwards as much as I can. Uh, so mom to seven says, have you used seen patients recover from POTS dysautonomia while with saline infusions? Good question. And the question is, I... I let me, let me put the word recover, and I'll use that a little differently. I think it's a great first step. I think by itself, it's, and this is the challenge, I think, of long COVID, is it's not one individual treatment that's going to correct everything. But I think it's a great first start and probably the most important thing to do. And with saline, I'll, I'll use B12 and magnesium to have support for that. But it definitely, in, in people that are hypovolemic, which is a large part of the POTS population, they feel a lot better after that. And they can get to the point where they can functionally, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, walk around without a racing heart rate or palpitations or shortness of breath. Definitely a big first step. But I'm always resident in saying that one thing solves all the problems. And in long COVID, we've definitely learned that it's a, a multifactorial approach to solve it. Got it. Got it. So thank you very much for that. Um, then there are there's so many questions. So I'm going <laughs> to try to... Uh, I hope they don't ask me the mechanisms. <laughs> so, okay, to let go, is the video and audio sync is off, Mobin. So, yes, my video and audio is always out of sync. The reason for that is this mic plugs into the Go XLR, which then plugs into the Black Magic, which then goes to the camera. Then from there, it comes in here. So, it is always out of sync. My apologies. <laughs> it's just you usually miss it because I'm sharing the screen. So, you don't know I'm on a side out of sync. But Apologies. Well, I was going to take that question. I could answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. So <laughs> Nipa says, what precautions should young people take to avoid SAD, especially from cardiac arrest? So, so interesting you say that. So one thing I do measure, and I may not be the only mechanism, I do measure things like D-dimer, right, which is one mechanism behind that. I think also, even if you look at things like hypovolemia could actually play a role as well, right, because it's more stress on cardiac function. I think if someone is symptomatic with either chest pain, shortness of breath, especially with mild exertion, I think it's worthwhile to do an echocardiogram to see, to make sure the heart is functioning properly. And what's interesting, and, and Mobin, correct me if I'm wrong on this, that's also helpful from hypovolemia 
diagnosis. If the ejection fraction is very high, that's also very confirmatory that the patient is in a hypovolemic state. And that when they start and exert themselves, they're going to put so much more stress on the body and that can create issues. Absolutely. So if I was somewhere in the administration, I would have said that at this time, whole nation gets a baseline of cardiovascular cardiovascular workup, neurological workup, hormone workup, kidney, liver, GIT functional workup, and baseline it. Because to me, it seems like there are so many people who are suffering and we do not know where exactly the pathology is, but there is pathology. So very good question, Nipa. Thank you. Uh, M. Gregory says... Bobin, if I can answer one more thing about that. So one actual thing is D-dimers we talk about. I do see in a large number of patients an elevated D-dimer. And a D, you want to explain, you're better explaining what that is than I am. <laughs> so you are always explaining better. I just like to dive deeper into the mechanisms. So D-dimers are when there are clots formed or microthrombi formed within the blood vessel. So imagine my fingers are like fibrin clots and we they are kind of mushed together. And when we break them and open the clots, then those tiny pieces that are formed for snipping and breaking, these are called D-dimers. So D-dimers are actually an indicator of breaking clots, but breaking clot is an indicator of making clots. And if we are always making some clots and breaking them all the time, but if that becomes too much, then that means we are in thrombotic state. Uh, there is a study from uh, Canada that recently came out. That study shows that antinuclear antibodies, D-dimers, CRP, interferon gamma together are a good indicator of long COVID for fatigue, neuromuscular uh, problems, and cough. And they say that over time in one year, the ANA levels reduce to half. So meaning there is some level of gradual improvement as well. Do you see your patients continue to improve over time or do they yeah. stay stable? Or No, I time? definitely. So what's interesting, I don't see a lot of elevated CRPs, interesting enough. I do, and the more severe, I had a case recently and he came to me a year after the vaccine. His CRP was 125. And it was, it had remained like that for a year. So this was an interesting case. And even when he got symptomatically better, the CRP did not improve, interesting enough. So it wasn't correlated. He was able to do more functional stuff and really feel a lot better. So that's the case. ANAs, I don't see as elevated as much. What I do see elevated a lot are thyroid peroxidase levels, which is one of the um, immune markers that look at thyroid. That I see, where, and what's interesting about it, I see autoimmune thyroid markers in the setting of normal thyroid function. So it's not a thyroid dysfunctional aspect, but instead an autoimmune process that's going on. And that definitely does get better over time. Interesting. So M. Gregory says, question, can acupressure ease you out of stress state? I think anything that helps you re relax in that form absolutely would be helpful dramatically. I'm not an expert in acupressure, so I don't want to go too deeply in it. But yes, I think anything that has a positive effect would be good. Absolutely. Uh, Daniel says, is Dr. Keith using lumbrokinase, natokinase, or pine bark extract for managing vascular issues? A oh, great question. I use a lot of yellow kinase. I really like it a lot. And again, the reason I use that more than the others is really the low risk of, of bleeding episodes from that. In the And again, with elevated D-dimers, that's one of the treatments we'll use. And, and also, I'll also try it if someone has brain fog or tinnitus that didn't respond to other treatments, we'll use that as well. I will use natokinase as well. And I also sometimes use serapeptase as well. This is an excellent question. Gina says, does intermittent fasting help tinnitus? I want to give my experience first. Okay. I had been doing intermittent fasting and I actually did feel that my tinnitus had reduced. For a couple of weeks, I ditched in intermittent fasting because my wife was making some really good foods <laughs> and I started eating them. And my, my tinnitus is back. This is just an anecdote, but that is what happened to me. How about... I, I would say yes. So one of, I talked earlier about one of the mechanisms... We see two mechanisms that really are affected by the intermittent fasting. One is cortisol regulation. 
So of course, we now know from studies that intermittent fasting, one of the benefits is it actually lowers cortisol. So people have much lower cortisol. And one of the issues I see around with COVID is this dysregulation of cortisol. And in, in some individuals, which is really interesting, is almost like their circadian rhythm flips, where they'll have often low cortisol in the morning and higher cortisol at night. So that definitely gets better. And my favorite topic, which is also blood glucose regulation, also gets better. And insulin sensitivity or, or insulin resistance becomes better also with intermittent fasting. So I have a question intermittent fasting. So I always retort, and I want to hear your thought on this, mm-hmm. is that you want to finish eating earlier at night, more importantly than fasting through the morning. So I always tell yeah. people, and I want to see what your thoughts are, I'll have them finish dinner early. To me, that's much more important than missing breakfast and eating later in the morning. Absolutely what do you feel correct. About? So my intermittent fasting <laughs> after uh, I watched the work or read the work from Dr. Professor Anna Carvio, if I'm pronouncing her last name correctly, she had said that the 16-hour window should include the sleep as well. So what I had been doing is I take breakfast in the morning at whatever time. I wake up 5 or 6 in the morning. Now it is 5. So I take breakfast at that time. And then I take my lunch, dinner, kind of a little late, for example, instead of 12, maybe 1 or 2. But that's it. And then that allows the 16-hour window to go into the sleep time because the microautophagy starts at 14th hour of fasting. And we need the microautophagy to be active for brains, you know, cleaning as well, if you will. And that has to occur during sleep. So you are actually correct. And I think that's the thing people, like I hear a lot of people says, okay, I stop eating at 8 p.m. and I don't eat till 11 a.m. That's really not what the goal is. The goal is to allow for repair. And repair really happens during sleep. The sleep, especially for the brain tissue. So that means if you have, let's say, 14 hours of fast, and that starts from you had the dinner at 8 o'clock at night, and you said, you know what, I'm going to just continue and have my uh, breakfast later. 8 8 to 8, let's say you started at 8 at night, 12 hours and then 2 more hours, 10. That At 10 o'clock is when autophagy is going to start for the brain. But if you're awake at that time, brain is going to turn off the switch to do autophagy. It's going to say, I'm working right now. I'm not going to do (laughs) autophagy. So you're going to miss the boat to do the autophagy. So yes, early dinner or late lunch and then stop till the breakfast and breakfast can be at the correct time and i use it so i also look at from a digestive perspective my i really believe people should defeat really the digestive process before they go to sleep so the body doesn't have to use resources towards digestion and i think I, it's interesting people know if they eat late and then go to sleep oftentimes they'll wake up in the morning bloated because that digestive process was not completed got it thank you very much All right, so some more questions. Danger Zone says, what is the cause and treatment of joint, tendon, and muscle pain? So a couple of things. One thing, uh, definitely one thought process is mitochondrial damage, where it's affecting the production of ATP. We definitely see that more and more common. Um, I think the transient, what we call autoimmune thyroid, can have an effect as well. Um, And even any any post-inflammatory process, too, is going to put stress on the muscles and joints as well. So give me one second. I want to open a study, if I can quickly get it, which would strengthen the point that you just made. So let me bring this study here. And I'll talk while you're doing that. So what it is, is one of the things I'm, we're learning more and more, and kind of where we didn't focus in the beginning, is the importance of really correcting mitochondrial function and really supporting that then during the process. Yeah. So check this study out. This is a study. uh, What is the date in this one? Some date here, but I think it is 2022 study. In this study, what they say is they had some patients go through exercise and these patients had the muscle and joint pains. And what they found out was that the mitochondria were not functioning correctly and the marker for that was number one the fat oxidation problem so fatty um, 
metabolism for fats, incorrect and lactic acid buildup. These both pointed towards the mitochondrial damage or mitochondrial dysfunction, which in turn means muscle have less energy, which also means there is lactic acid produced and acidosis is occurring, which will mean when you move your muscles, you're going to start having pain. So one possibility for the pain is the, the mitochondrial dysfunction within the muscle leading to the pain. The other possibility is that, <coughs> excuse me, when there are autoimmune antibodies, those antibodies that are against, for example, let's say neuromuscular junctions, what happens is when there is a nerve that is connecting into neuromuscular junction and you disrupt that nerve, it is possible that the nerve is now losing its connection and is not that synapse is not working correctly. That means the muscle fiber is not going to work very good. The group of fibers are not going to contract very well. So your brain is saying, contract this biceps and the biceps is saying I cannot employ all of the fibers so the remaining fibers that are still working they are pulling the load for the work and they would start aching this is another possibility the third possibility is that when the neuromuscular junctions become damaged then the neuronal axonal sprouting occurs sprouting means that the nearby healthy neurons would try to say you know what I'm going to make an extra branch that would cover this neuro uh, this neuromuscular synapse and if they make too many branches then the neuron body has to send all those branches the food to eat and atp and the nutrients and take away things from them and the body may not be able to take care of that that would mean body will undergo stress and the neuron can die which can make the pains permanent so there are so many mechanisms that are possible with vaccine or with uh, long COVID. And what about, I guess the other one is, is vascular, right? If microclotting, of course. right? So microclotting can also, especially if people get Absolutely. pain in, in, I call the end, end joint, end muscles. In Absolutely. The hands and the feet. Absolutely. So uh, here is a question. Megatron says, NMN for raising NAD levels to help with mitochondrial health lower neuroinflammation and blood flow thoughts on NAD levels in relation to all of this. So I just had a case today where we discussed this actually. So, and we would discuss this right before then. Definitely NAD I do use as part of it. I also use coenzyme Q10 and that other, and look at other, what we call mitochondrial cofactors definitely plays a role. The question about NAD, and this is always my question in the setting and, and maybe Mobin can answer. Is that a problem or if someone in the setting of someone who's hypovolemic starting to give a lot of any, and I, that's where I would be careful. I, I'll agree with you. So that means once again, if we go back to your approach, first correct the volume and then start looking at other things. Okay, so here is a question. Um, there are so many questions, Keith. Anson Miedo <laughs> says, are the B cells or tumor necrosis factor alpha implicated? A lot of my military co-workers are now diagnosed with rare autoimmune disease too since incurring COVID, ankylosing spondylitis, NMO, sarcoidosis, RA, and so on. Do they hear my speech at the conference? <laughs> <laughs> and did they? So, so it, you... it brings up my, and Moby knows this is my favorite medication. So the answer is yes. And I think that's part of the, again, you're talking about two different things, immune complex related, and also post-inflammatory, you know, being tuned across factor, being a cytokine, definitely big plays a major role. And I think that we're seeing in the, I would say the, I would say the sicker patients are developing autoimmune disease, definitely. And that's where the role of things like low-dose naltrexone plays such a major role. And it's so unique. And I, you know, Mobin's talked about this before, how it actually is able to really address multiple cytokines that are out there and help really quell that, very strong inflammatory response. But I am seeing a lot of new autoimmune disease. Actually, I have three new cases this week where patients have been to all these doctors. They looked at, for example, thyroid function. They were normal and all three of these cases actually have elevated thyroid antibodies, but in the setting of normal thyroid function. So when the, the regular blood work was done, it was never picked up because they weren't looking at the autoimmune beyond the function itself. And, and to add to this one, the continuous presence of inflammation ends up causing more 
autoimmune diseases. And I'll explain why. So it is possible that the basic injury to the body starts with some other disease. For example, let's say SARS-CoV-2. But then as there is autoantibodies or other temporary antibodies that are produced that are causing sustained inflammation, then what happens is, let me share my screen. So imagine this, uh, and I'm sorry for the black background, I make them transparent so that I can put them in whatever document I want. So if you see here, this is a broken cell. And this broken cell, imagine this got broken because of some inflammation. When it was broken, the cell's guts or the contents of the cell and the nucleus spilled out. Now, most of these content are kind of new thing for our immune system. Our immune, <laughs> our immune system, my apologies, my, our immune system is generally able to identify ourself and ignore it. But those things that are packaged within the cell can appear new to our immune system. On, on top of that, this little monster that I've made over here, the reactive oxygen species. So imagine this is a vulture. So the cell broke down. The guts are spilling out. And this little vulture, the reactive oxygen species, is present in the vicinity and it continues to damage and denature even these dead cells. So what happens is when immune cells come here, imagine there's an immune cell here looking at this broken cell and pondering if it is self or not. And this little monster is deshaping and denaturing these proteins. Our immune cell would think, well, this may be foreign material. These may be antigens. And the anti-nuclear antibodies and other kind of antibodies would start coming into place. And now we have created autoimmune disease. So it is actually possible that chronic inflammation, for some other reason, can translate into becoming autoimmune diseases or give rise to autoimmune diseases with which the patient may be stuck for, for years. Mobin, do you also think, I mean, now we're seeing a lot more research, like for example, Epstein-Barr virus and its link to autoimmune disease. Could actually COVID-19 also have that similar effect on the body that we're seeing with Epstein-Barr virus? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's even worse. Epstein-Barr virus, we know what it does and we know how long and the relapse occurs and here is what happens with the relapse. COVID is just so strange. It's very, it's, it is very diverse in its impact. Okay, so let's have one more question. And I know it is 6.54. I know you're on the East Coast. It's almost 10 <laughs> o'clock. I am by 10 o'clock sleeping, not, not today with the coffee. So a couple of more questions. Oh, I'm good. We're good. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you for this. Since uh, you had your coffee, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Telepathic effects. ZZ Berman says, doctors, are you seeing an improvement in patients with MCAS histamine issue as well as as well over time? Thank you for your time and expertise. Y yes. And, and so what's interesting about MCAS and histamine, again, uh, we use a multiple approach. Prior to COVID, we actually used to use low-dose naltrexone antihistamines with that. But also I find that when we give good gut support and also a low histamine diet, people are getting better. That and, that and I'm seeing more and more now cases of MCAS and histamine now than I did earlier in the pandemic. But yes, they do get better with that. And uh, before I put this question up, I want to say this, that yes, it is very difficult to find doctors who are doing their research or who are trying to figure out long COVID vaccine injury, these are a thing and how to manage them. So here is the question. Andrea says, how can I see Dr. Keith? Seriously, is he virtual? So <laughs> first, my disclaimer, I have no commercial interest with Keith. I have no commissions. I have nothing. But it will actually be good if you have time and you can help manage some more patients. So how can people find you and are you virtual? So, uh, so I have a website, www.centerforbalancedhealth.com. That's my website. I am located in New York, and currently I am seeing patients in New York and in Florida, soon to be, we'll add New Jersey as well, and maybe California. We're not sure yet, but as of that point, that's where I'm able to see people. Excellent. Thank you very much. And one more question before we uh, probably take off. Danger Zone says, is navy blue in color of the day? So my 
Do you know what's so interesting? We did not coordinate on this. We did and not. Although I did ask prior to the show where I can get a sweater like that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Wait, you know what's interesting about that? Mobeen's in California, which is typically a warmest state. He's wearing a sweater. And I'm in New York, which is now starting to go through cold spell wearing a, a, sh a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> we in California are comfortably spoiled. <laughs> My brother makes fun of me. I, so I have lived in Massachusetts for 13 years. And I used to be in, you know, in leg deep snow and cleaning my cars and, and moving about. And my brother has been in Ontario, Canada. Uh, and he makes, sen uh, he makes fun of me that you start wearing sweaters because you actually don't have an, an opportunity <laughs> to wear them. So you just wear them for fashion. So uh, one more question. Golden Time says, is fibromyalgia linked with autoimmune disease? So, so it's interesting. So what's interesting about fibromyalgia, a lot of it's a term I don't like, actually, because it, it's, it's a very, you know, kind of ambiguous term. But there is a lot more research thinking that it may be a viral disease related to Epstein-Barr virus. And we actually said before, Epstein-Barr virus, now there's more studies. There's a recent study done early this year where Epstein-Barr virus, they thought, is one of the mechanisms behind developing multiple sclerosis, I do think that there is uh, a link that Epstein-Barr virus and probably also COVID-19 that, as we said before, can link to autoimmune disease. Absolutely. Excellent. So two minutes to the hour. Let's see if there is anything. There, there are so many questions still. Um, I could I could take a couple more if you want. Okay, excellent. All right. So let's start with the So after the fibromyalgia, actually that question has been there a little more. So actually we saw this one as well. I have a question for you. The, the therapy, the saline and then magnesium and the vitamin C, usually how many times a week and who pays for it? Does insurance cover? Number one and number two, how many times? So, so again, so I'll separate it out. I don't always start with vitamin C. And the reason why, what's interesting about vitamin C is one of the main side effects is actually the lower blood glucose level. And so if someone's very hypovolemic, you don't want to do that right off the bat because it can make them worse. So with about the normal saline, it depends on the patient. Normally I look, I'll do it once a week for about three times and see how they do and how they feel. And, and it's an easy test to do. We can do blood pressure, pulse, lying down, sitting, standing. I'll walk them down the hallway. If that starts to get better, then I'll go on to oftentimes the vitamin C. And again, I'll also do that in sections of three. I mean, again, depending on insurance, insurance can reimburse some of that, depending on your insurance plan. The nice thing about normal sailing, it's not that expensive to do, which is nice. Vitamin, IV vitamin C may be a little bit more expensive. But again, in people that can't do intravenous, I'll do things, which one interesting thing I'll do, and it's somewhat effective, not as effective, is I'll have them add something like Himalayan salt or something to their water a couple times a day and see if that can also help increase some of their volume as well. It's, what's interesting about that, early on, in the, I had several cases where, and, and Mobini, you've seen that, where I've had my diabetics who've been so well controlled prior to COVID, their glucose is just go out of crazy, mm. go up. And one of the treatments that I found that worked is actually when I hydrated them and actually I had Himalayan salt, that actually helped more than any of the medications in bringing down their blood glucose levels because they actually probably developed also from the glucose going up higher, some hypovolemia as well. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, Texas Meg says, so uneven muscle fiber effort and sprouting, this is a lot. Uh, review time. No, don't say permanent. Okay, so in some cases permanent and here is how. When the neuronal sprouting occurs, so imagine this was a neuron with one axon and that axon was finishing on this some tissue, neuromuscular junction or neuroendocrine or whatever. And then this synapse became stressed out. And because of that, this branch, this axon is not working correctly. So this neuron, imagine I'm the neuron, 
neuron decides, you know what, I'm going to sprout, I'm going to make more branches, or my neighboring healthy neuron decides to sprout. So, so far, it's okay. when Once they cover that little synapse, they're okay. But if this continues, for example, in chronic inflammation, as may be occurring with SARS-CoV-2 or vaccine injury or other issues, then the neurons would continue to sprout as there is continuous resistance at the neuromuscular junctions or the, the muscle is not working because of the mitochondrial dysfunction, vascular problems, other anti, anti, uh, sorry, autoimmune problems. So now when the too many branches have formed, the headquarters, the neuron body, is still responsible to nourish them all. And the energy stress or nutrient stress on the cell body is a stress as well. This is like if a parent, a set of parents, they have 100 children and they have to feed them all. That is a stress on them. So when the neuron body cannot feed them all because of two numerous branches, the neuron decides to commit suicide and die by apoptosis. So that will then end up in a permanent problem with the muscle control. And that can cause permanent pain because less nerve fibers, more muscle fibers, and there is an async. Do you think that happens more? So again, the more peripheral the issue is. So the further away from the heart, the more problematic that becomes. Correct. This especially occurs when there is a autoimmune issue with the neuromuscular junctions or the autoimmune issue with the uh, receptor. Uh, you know, there are antibodies against the receptors, which happens with the long COVID, that there can be antibodies against the acetylcholine receptors or noradrenergic receptors, which causes epinephrine and acetylcholine not to work correctly, which then causes this whole cycle. And if it continues, this, this is also why it is not interesting for the patients to do rigorous exercises because the more load they put in the muscle the more muscle would say i need neuro you know neuronal activity and the more sprouting would occur this is why it is important to just keep the exercise light keep yourself fit in shape and slowly continue to grow the exercise uh, management or exercise routine all right so one last question promise. A queen says, why does methylene blue seems to be helping reverse my low blood pressure increases increase exercise capacity? Very good question. We have an answer. I'm going to have you give that one because you do, okay. you do talk about that. <laughs> yes. So I actually just recorded a lecture for FLCCC for it. Uh, methylene blue is such a beautiful system, but in general, what it does is low dose methylene blue 0 0.5 to 4 milligram per kilogram body weight low dose not high dose in high dose it is actually reversed so that is it becomes toxic low dose methylene blue has a special propensity towards neuronal tissues so it likes to go to the neuronal tissues so when it is given orally or systemically it can go to the neuronal tissue number one number two low dose methylene blue helps restore mitochondrial function. Do you know how it does that? So in the mitochondria, the complex four, the electron transport chain, the complex four needs electron complex one, two, three, and four. They all work with the electrons, but the electron donors are FADH, FADH2 and NADH, right? When there is a mitochondrial dysfunction, the complexes, electron transport chain stops working and the production of electrons for the chain reduces. Methylene blue comes in and says, oh, well, the, the machine is not working for the electrons. I will give electrons. I don't have to run the whole machine. This is like if your kitchen is not working and you say, you know what? I cannot cook food today. My kitchen, my stove is not working. My sink is not working. My coffee machine is not working. And some angel comes in and says, forget about all of that. I've already cooked food for you and here it is. You don't need to run your kitchen. So methylene blue becomes the electron donor. Once the electron donation occurs to the complex four, the second thing it does is, so hold on to this thought that the methylene blue gives the electron. The second thing it does is, it consumes the oxygen present in the mitochondrial environment. 
it converts that into water. So what happens is the result is number one, electron transport chain can start working again. And number two, as oxygen consumption increases because methylene blue help create water from that, more oxygen is needed. Another thing that happens is that nitric oxide production, complex four is responsible for increasing the nitric oxide levels. So when oxygen levels go down because methylene blue use them, nitric oxide levels go up. When nitric oxide levels go up, that causes vasodilatation. And all of a sudden there is flow of blood coming in and the blood comes in and it brings in nutrients and it brings in more oxygen and the mitochondrial functions start becoming better and the lactic acid and the carbon dioxide and other bad things are washed out. And all of a sudden neuronal tissue feels happy. And finally, what methylene blue does is it reduces the chances of apoptosis or it improves the survival of the neurons. So not only neurons become healthy, they survive as well and the neuronal tissue starts becoming better. That is methylene blue. And I'm not sure we have another compound that really works that way, right? That we no. know of. No. And if you wanted to watch this lecture, I just did it for FLCCC. There is a YouTube channel called Long Story Short with Dr. Bean on which FLCCC puts all of these lectures. Interestingly, these get 200 views or 500 views. And I feel that for long COVID patients and vaccine injured patients, that is a gold mine. It's just that no, not many people know about it. And these lectures that I'm speaking go over there. And, and I, can I make a comment about long COVID and vaccine injured for a second? Yes, please. I think people have to realize, and I think that's their frustration, that it's such a varied mechanism that you have to keep on digging deeper and deeper and looking at different possibilities. And, and, and I know people often get frustrated because of that, but they, I always tell people, you just, if you haven't found the answer, you haven't looked enough and you have to keep on looking And the answer. It may not fix everything, but people do get better and increase functionality. And the other thing we talked about, but we're finding that it may take a longer time than we thought for repair and resolution to happen. Absolutely. So with this, what a beautiful <laughs> discussion. And I think it is actually such a sad thing that the long videos are watched less. But these videos are so full of beautiful content that doctors can actually run their clinics based on these discussions and <laughs> serve a lot of patients. So thank you very much for being here. Cool Beans, thank you very much for being here as well and watching and listening and learning. Please uh, don't use this as a prescription, but instead talk with your doctors and your providers and see what can be done. Thank you, Keith, for your time. Well, thank you for having me. Perfect. Cool Beans, thank you very much. If you would like to support this work, there are links in the description that you can use to support. I would see you tomorrow. Bye, Keith. Good night. Thank you.